I'm Eric Lassan, and today's webinar entitled What I Learned in Prison will be presented by Melissa Michaud, Professor of Politics and Chair of the New Politics, Policy, Law, and Ethics Department. She also contributes to the Women and Gender Studies Program. Her research and teaching centers on American social policy, especially welfare and healthcare policy, and on the criminal justice system. For the past five years, she has also taught a class called Restorative Justice at the Oregon State Penitentiary with 16 Willamette students and 16 prisoners. And now, here's Professor Michaud. I want to thank you for having me. I really appreciate all of you who have um, showed up to hear about what I've learned in prison. We live in an age of mass incarceration. We house over 2.3 million people locked up in state prisons, federal prisons, juvenile correctional facilities, local jails, military prisons, Indian country jails, immigration detention centers, and civil commitment centers. And that 2.3 million is a very large number, but it represents just a single snapshot in time. Over 11 million people cycle through jails every year. They are an astonishing number, 820,000 people on parole and another 3.8 million on probation. The terms of which can be exceedingly strict and send many people straight to prison without anyone committing a new crime. In fact, that's one of the big explanations for the higher recidivism rates in the United States. Not, not everyone is, is committing a new crime. I was just talking to um, a formerly incarcerated person about his parole terms. He had been in prison 19 years and then he was um, paroled with three years on parole, and that included paying monthly fines for supervision. Of course, he had to have a job, but also he couldn't drink. He couldn't associate with other people um, who are on parole or with um, felony convictions. There are quite a lot of rules um, for him to follow, and um, of course, he had to be subject to uh, randomized uh, drug testing as well. Mass incarceration is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, it's really happened over my adult lifetime, and I'm not that old yet. There is good news there in that um, it has primarily occurred because of changes in policy, which means that you can also undo those policies to reduce incarceration. Undoing the policies might be a bit harder than... Um, we might hope, but uh, this is a time where there's been a lot of reform efforts and uh, bipartisan support for reform. The U.S. is exceptional in its rate of incarceration and not in a good way. The land of the free is not so free, which I think is part of the reason why in um, more recent years we've seen a coming together of both Republican and Democrats around solving the mass incarceration issue. Uh, but we ha still have quite a long way to go. We're not gonna be able to do it just by um, focusing on, on drug crimes. In Oregon, the incarceration rate, like the national average, was heading up modestly from about 78 to 1990, and then it experienced a slight drop before rising dramatically in the mid-1990s. Um, why did Oregon have this dramatic increase beginning in the mid-1990s? Um, the answer is ballot measure 11, which set mandatory minimum prison sentences for certain crimes, eliminated probation and parole for those crimes, and required that juveniles age 15 and over be tried as adults. The primary driver of U.S. incarceration rates is not crime, but public policies that keep men and we are overwhelmingly talking about men, but also increasingly women, in prison for very long terms. People who are convicted of crimes in the US stay in prison longer than they ever have before for those same crimes, and much more than in other countries that we consider our peers. Across the US, we pursued a politics of punishment, three strikes and you're out laws, ending parole, and establishing these mandatory minimums. 
And like nearly every problem we have in the United States, mass incarceration is worse for poor people and for people of color. 80% 80 of all criminal defendants are indigent, which means that they cannot afford a private attorney. And men of color are disproportionately represented in our prisons. This means that there are communities of poor, of, there are communities where pe poor men of color, sorry, who believe that prison is their destiny or even a rite of passage. So that one in three African-American men born since 2001 um, will spend some time incarcerated. Those are pretty uh, shocking statistics uh, and we need to do something about that. Um, you, if you signed up for the webinar, you perhaps saw this picture. I need to give a photo credit to Frank Miller. I, I, I appreciate this picture. Um, as an aside, I showed up for this photo shoot having completely forgotten that I was getting my picture taken. So I hadn't given any thought to what I was wearing except that it had to meet prison code. Um, because I was going inside for a meeting afterwards. And so I showed up with a shirt with oranges on it. And you could have just seen Frank's face. He was so disappointed. <laughs> and he's like, do you have a jacket, anything? Um, and I didn't have anything else. And so I love that Frank made me look uh, tough, uh, this compelling picture. I generally feel the opposite of tough, especially in prison. I'm no longer scared, but that was my first experience going inside. And in retrospect, I probably should have worked my way up to maximum security. Um, but no, my first trip inside any prison at all was the Oregon State Penitentiary, um, which is Oregon's only maximum security prison. It is about 150 years old, and in many places, it looks like it. Uh, and here's what I wrote in a journal about my first visit. Scared, I, I kept thinking, what if something terrible happens to me, even something accidental, not necessarily directed at me? I will have done this to myself. And who does that? Who goes to prison voluntarily? Who goes to prison if they don't have to? I followed all the rules and dressing and leaving my belongings in the car, reading over them multiple times to make sure I hadn't missed anything. The rabbi shows up, but he barely looks at me. Feels like he's done this a million times. He has me sign something that says, I know I am at risk of injury, kidnapping, and death. Since I'd already considered those things, this doesn't unnerve me. I barely remember the walk to the classroom, or rather, I experienced it as a series of bizarre rituals. Take your shoes off here, wait for this gate, sign in again here, stick your hand in what looks like a mail slot further so you can be stamped. Give up your driver's license, put on your visitor badge, now walk here, now wait here. Scary moment with prisoners in blue walking all around me on the stairwell. Is it okay to be in a stairwell with just a scrawny rabbi? Say your name, wait, walk, wait, here we are. It's funny to me to uh, think about what I wrote that first time. But I kept writing, I'm nervous about what a group of violent offenders are going to think about me, an academic. They're friendly, even charming. They want to talk to me. They look at me continually for validation, for encouragement. I didn't expect that. They want me to know that they are remorseful. They are changed. I believe them, and yet I am wary. I do not feel in any physical danger here. I worry about getting emotionally sucked in because at this moment, I cannot imagine anything more compelling than these men trying to make meaning of their lives, given the constraints of extensive, even life sentences, and the responsibility they bear for their actions. Needless to say, I did get sucked in. Um, and so most of what I told you in the beginning, all those stats, that's what I knew before I went into prison. And when I got there, I learned some, some things maybe I should have already known, um, but were made very clear to me, including that the totality of a person is not the worst act he's ever committed. And in some ways, this is a really hard lesson and a reassuring one all at once. I have met men convicted of a range of violent crimes who are also incredible artists, devoted sons, loving fathers, talented poets and performers, philosophers, 
Small business entrepreneurs, musicians and songwriters, hospice workers, mentors, fundraisers for hurricane relief, proud uncles and visionaries for peace. So um, this is a picture of one of my classes and in the front rows um, sitting down in the middle is Theron, an African-American prisoner who was 11 years old when his stepfather gave him a bag of drugs and told him not to come home until he'd sold them all. Um, his mother was an addict and as Theron recounts, uh, he uh, often wanted love and attention from her, but she was largely incapable of giving it because of her addiction. And he felt that she chose the drugs over him repeatedly. He ended up in foster care for a period of time, but eventually um, was on the streets and joined a gang and basically sold drugs to, uh, as a livelihood. And about 30 some days after his 18th birthday, he was at a party, intoxicated, got into a fight with a rival drug dealer. Um, Theron says he didn't mean to kill this uh, rival drug dealer, but he did. Um, and now he is serving life without the possibility of parole. Uh, we have a reform project at the end of every class, different uh, things that we work on to try to change the system. And the second year that Theron did the class, while he, when he was a facilitator, he came to me and he said, I have a reform project I want to do. I really want to be a bone marrow donor and, I'm, and OSP and tells me I can't. And uh, Theron said, I don't see why I can't consent to giving bone marrow and I don't want anything in exchange for it, but I've been thinking about how I can give back. And I think this is an important way I and other prisoners can give back. And it just so happened in that class was Sam, who's um, sitting right behind Theron, who had donated bone marrow the summer before. And so they created a group that, um, worked on trying to figure out what were the rules and regulations and, and why couldn't they um, get on the registry. Uh, Sam and Leah, another uh, Willamette student, actually took it all the way to the Oregon legislature and it became a bill. It had a, a sponsors. It didn't get a hearing uh, yet, at least. Um, but that's just sort of one of the extraordinary stories from that class. There's also Sterling in this picture who is in the back row, probably about the tallest prisoner in the back row. I think of him as my co-pilot in these classes because he's probably the most well-respected prisoner who has eschewed violence and um, tries to build peace within prison. He's trying to transform the very culture of prison. And because he's so well respected, he brings people from um, all different races and ethnicities into the class. He recruits them in. And then if any conflicts develop or I step in things that I don't know about, um, he eases the way. If um, I always think it's fun, if the uh, men in prison have trouble with uh, my instructions or directions or um, complain about the reading. Usually he's the tough one that um, tells them to get it done. Uh, and yet he's devoted himself to this, um, the work of nonviolence because he was very violent as a child. Um, at the age of 12, he lost his primary caregiver, who was his grandmother, and he was sent to live um, with an abusive grandfather. And in when that didn't work out, then he was sent to um, live with his 21-year-old uncle in Portland, who was heavily involved in criminal activity. Um, and at the very young age of 16. He ended up in and out of trouble and at the age of 16 uh, took a life in a, um, 
a terrible set of circumstances. And he knows he cannot bring, um, take back those actions or bring back that life. Um, and it was actually two lives with two of them involved. Um, so he says his, the next thing he can do is work for, um, for peace and uh, to reduce violence. There's Nolan who's standing just behind me, Native American. His father was in prison, grandfather was in prison, uncles. Um, and he was brought up just knowing that he was going to spend time in prison and that uh, in the childhood that he had, he didn't really necessarily see that much wrong with that. When he came to interview to be in my class, I asked him, you know, why he wanted to take the class because he hadn't um, taken any other classes before. Um, and he said he didn't know exactly, but he knew something had to be different and he needed to change his life and he didn't know how to. Um, Nolan is sober now in prison, which by the way, you, you're not necessarily sober in prison. Um, uh, he is a beautiful, incredible writer who has been sorting through a whole variety of really um, family trauma, generational trauma, um, as he also claims his uh, Native American practices and heritages, heritage. Uh, to hear him sing, he has this strong, amazing voice um, is really a joyful thing to behold. I could tell you stories like these about nearly everyone um, in this picture. I'll, I'll just tell one more and then I'll move on because uh, I don't want to take all night. But Carlos is in the light blue um, standing kind of in the middle. And uh, Carlos has been gang involved, uh, is gang involved. It's hard to get out of gangs when you're in prison. Um, and I always give, this is a 300 level class and I give the um, students, Willamette students and prisoners, the same readings. They're um, high level, difficult readings. One year I used a book which is really about policy implementation and bureaucratic constraints for prison reform. It is the kind of book a policy wonk like me would love and does love. And as I came into the class to talk about the book, it was amazing to look over at Carlos and just see how his face lit up talking about policy implementation and he just wanted to know more. And I've often thought if he had had just a different beginning of life and different set of circumstances, you know, I would, might have been rec writing a recommendation for him for a master's in public policy. So um, what else have I learned in prison? Prison has its own vocabulary. Uh, and some of that is pretty easy to understand. You know, one celly is basically a roommate. The weight pile is where people can work out with weights. If a guy says that's when he fell, it means that's when he was convicted and sent to prison. And while he's prison, he is down. So he might say, I've been down 10 years and I have five more to go. This language of fallen and being down seems quite fitting to me. Fallen from grace, from society, a kind of banishment along with its attendant sense of shame. Being down is more apropos somehow than being locked up. There's so little up in prison, quite a lot of down, both emotionally and physically. There's also the whole or segregation, which is short for, or seg, short for segregation. And I had always assumed the whole was reserved for violent offenses. And I kind of understood the dynamic that it can be hard to avoid fights especially when someone is new to a prison and people are testing that um, prisoner. But no, I had four guys threatened with the hole for trying to use computers to type a paper for my class, even though they had passes to be there. Um, luckily, that didn't happen. But my first year, David was sent to the hole when he was caught using 
um, pot. Omar was in the hole on suspicion alone and missed an organizing meeting uh, one January. Uh, don't worry, everyone told me. He didn't do anything, so he'll only be there two weeks. Um, Johnny uh, ate a sandwich that he wasn't supposed to eat and was also sent to the hole for two weeks during an investigation. Now, and to understand, the hole is 23 out of 24 hours in a six by nine cell, uh, and any removal time from that cell is done shackled. Uh, so it's a really extreme form of punishment that um, we use regularly. The multi-purpose room, um, this is a euphemistic term prison staff use for the death chamber. The last execution took place in 1996 and there is uh, currently a moratorium on executions in Oregon. But multi-purpose is, that term is kind of ironic because there's only one purpose for that room. And it's often also quite chilling in its concealment of that purpose. So prison, as you um, can imagine, is largely about deprivation and punishment and endless dignities, indignities. And here I want to be careful. Number one, I have met terrific people working in corrections, both staff and in administration, who are really doing great work um, and uh, programming and trying to improve the situation. Number two, Oregon is not Oklahoma. Clay told me that. Um, he's been in prisons in about five different states, and he assures me Oklahoma, I mean, Oregon is the best and Oklahoma um, is the worst. And number three, OSP in particular has a great deal of programming that other prisons, especially ones in rural areas, do not have. Chemeca Community College has a branch inside OSP, and that's a huge asset. There's an automotive and electrical program. There are about a dozen sanctioned clubs, and I'll say more about that later. There are resources for a wide range of religious practices. There's yoga and nonviolent communication. There's even a parenting class where the men carry around baby dolls that they have to care for. And I'll tell you, the first time I came up around the stairwell and saw um, these baby dolls in, in baby carriers, that was a, kind of a shock. Um, However, our whole system is oriented around security first, which is understood rather narrowly as containment, control, and isolation. And I've already mentioned the cells that are about six by six feet by nine feet. So um, most of the men tell me that they can just stand in the middle, stretch their hands out, and feel both sides of the wall. Um, about half of the cells are double bunked. So you're seeing right here um, a cell block. And in those double bunked cells, you have two bunks on top of each other, and then you have a toilet and a sink. And when you have that kind of arrangement, there's a very small space. Some of them have a, a little table, but there's a very small space for a grown man to stand. So they usually have to kind of orchestrate it when they're in their cells together and they talk about doing the cell dance. Um, okay, you're on, the, you're on the bunk while I'm at the sink. Okay, uh, we'll move around here um, and then you'll get your turn. You are told when you can eat, sleep, work, shower, make a phone call, get a haircut. And thanks to Oregon voters and Measure 17, all prisoners must work. And now work in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, it can be quite good. But most of the men make under a dollar an hour and they are charged fees for phone calls, emails, uh, necessary commissary items, non-essential health care like glasses. Um, and then, of course, as you can probably imagine, uh, with COVID-19, you know, social distancing just isn't possible um, under these circumstances. Uh, I know that DOC and the Oregon um, uh, State Penitentiary are taking uh, COVID-19 very seriously and have created spaces for quarantining, 
Um, but the reality is they are too densely packed in um, to really prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Um, right now, the, all the volunteers and also uh, visitors are not allowed to, inside, which of course is also hard um, on the adults in custody. There is no privacy. I could walk out on that block while men are trying to get dressed or go to the bathroom. I have to, as a woman, I'd have to push a buzzer, buzzer to go out. Um, but then I can walk right out and see into every uh, cell right there. Families are subject to some pretty ridiculous clothing restrictions. I witnessed an overweight grandmother turned away for wearing leggings, a 10-year-old boy not allowed to visit because he's wearing blue shorts and you can't wear blue in prison because the um, incarcerated men all have to wear blue. Um, the food budget is not very high. I don't, I was told what it is in Oregon, I've since forgotten, but the national average is $2.37 cents a day uh, for all meals. And only two meals are served on weekends in Oregon and many other states. There's limited outdoor time or out of cell time depending on the level you're in. Um, uh, again, all contact with family is monitored. And of course, there's violence or the threat of violence, um, sort of pretty much constant. Uh, and that violence can come from other prisoners or from staff. And I think it's important for you to understand that prison was not always this way. We used to understand corrections as having the goal of rehabilitation, um, but rehabilitation went out of favor about the same time we started ripping up the safety net for poor families. And here is the key takeaway from all of that. All of that punishment doesn't make us safer. All of the added injustice of the system gets in the way of meaningful accountability. There are so many rules in prison, you can't possibly really follow them all, all the time. And so they end up getting administered in a somewhat arbitrary manner. And that arbitrariness produces resentment and then resistance. It's also true that total subjection to authority doesn't produce people able to cope with the outside world. Um, and neither does a six week reentry course when you've been locked up for 19 years since the age of 18, as Arnaldo was. Although Arnaldo does have sort of a happy story I'll tell at the end. One of the major problems is that incarceration increases the four sources of violence in the first place, shame, isolation, economic deprivation, and exposure to violence. That's how violence happens in the first place. And time in prison and uh, increases um, all of those risk factors for violence. So there's this odd thing that um, we want prisoners to be accountable for what they've done. But if they feel that the punishment is arbitrary, capricious, and unfair, you can spend a lot of time being angry at the system and not necessarily taking ownership or responsibility for what you've done. Um, and that's part of the reason that this punishment doesn't work the way we think it does. I had a, my own little taste of this, um, and this is kind of a silly example, but uh, I got very wound up about it, so I'll, I'll tell you, try to tell you quickly. Cake matters. Uh, at the end of each of my classes, I had been allowed to bring in a meal, generally, you know, sandwiches and fruit and juice, you know, um, cookies, things like that. And we'd share a meal together and that would be our send off to say goodbye. Well, um, after doing this for two years in a row, one year there was a new supervisor who told, said no, um, none of the classes can bring in food anymore. Um, you can have cake. You can, you can bring in food, but it has to be cake. No fruit. And this was 
very frustrating to me because I had done it two years before. There didn't seem to be any problems. There were no issues with it. And what's more, the men inside said the thing that they really craved the most and missed the most was fruit because they didn't get that much fresh fruit. Um, and I, it just didn't make sense to me. And <laughs> I was up at night. I mean, you would think that I would be incensed about solitary confinement, and I am, but I got really wound up about this cake issue. And my little act of rebellion was to go out and buy a very nice cake, uh, the chocolate cake from Conditorai, and then to buy a tres leche cake fruit on the top of it, um, which was somewhat silly, but it felt like I got a sense of how that frustration around the arbitrariness um, can work. Now, you might say, why should prisoners get cake? Um, what about victims? And that is an absolutely important question in any discussion around criminal justice reform. Um, I think there are a couple of responses to that. One of the biggest is that we have about half or more of victims of many crimes that do not report, that don't go to the police, um, that don't get any kind of justice, and that's for a variety of reasons, but um, one of the main ones is that in many communities with high crime rates, there is a distrust of police and the criminal justice system. And what we're not recognizing a lot of time is that young men of color have the highest rates of victimization. Um, and that's where ex um, exposure to violence, exposure to shame and isolation and economic deprivation also helps to produce violence. So there, um, absolutely any reform has to work to reduce violence in communities, reduce the number of victims, um, and really transform our understanding of how violence and incarceration uh, works. Um, one of the more troubling things I learned going to prison is about the foster care to prison pipeline. Um, I was shocked not only by how many of the men I work with had fathers that were previously incarcerated, but also how many had experienced um, foster care. Um, uh, there are about 437,000 children in America's foster care system who face a disproportionate risk of being incarcerated. Uh, the problem is so severe that a quarter of foster care uh, alumni will become involved with the criminal justice system within two years of leaving care. Uh, and if we, I don't know that we need more evidence of how we are failing um, young victims of domestic violence and childhood trauma, um, but we have it in our prisons. I probably knew, um, and you probably know, that prison is quite costly. Um, uh, and just, it just really brings it home for me when I know there are people who are incarcerated who are re transformed, um, who would not and are not a threat to our communities any longer, um, but it costs so much for us to keep them incarcerated. These are, this, these numbers are from California, um, about 62,000 per prisoner, um, per year. In Oregon, the number is more like 44,000. Uh, there are some big variation across the states, um, but generally where it costs less, it's because there are fewer services um, to prisoners or because they don't pay correction officers um, the way they should. Um, the reality is our criminal justice system just doesn't adequately address the community costs of crime or incarceration or the needs of victims. Um, and we really need a wholesale transformation of the system. Uh, and thinking about all the ways we're failing in the system, 
the children of uh, with incarcerated parents are six times more likely to end up in prison themselves. Um, and of course, there are significant consequences for our democratic life. Um, almost six million people are denied the right to vote due to felony convictions. Um, that matters. One study found that disenfranchisement policies likely affected the results of seven U.S. Senate races from 1970 to 1998, as well as the hotly contested 2000 Bush v. Gore um, presidential election. Uh, so that matters. And I, I could spend a whole nother uh, 30 some minutes just talking about transformative justice and I'm, I'm not gonna be able to give it its full throated defense here, but I just put that out. Um, uh, transformative justice makes a lot more sense. By the way, that picture uh, was done for me by Omar, who was also in that um, picture. Transformative justice principles um, start with the belief in the potential for human growth and development, um, really understand that human dignity requires that we not treat people as expendable and certainly not whole populations of poor Americans and people of color who are overrepresented in prison. Um, and this is core to the notion of transformative justice and the thing that I feel so certain about after spending time with prisoners and, and um, going inside OSP. So there are very few people who really can't uh, be transformed for whatever reason. And you can't know. <laughs> at any given moment. You can't write them off um, because they're continuing to be violent, because they've, um, because of what crime they've done or what issues they have. I have seen some um, incredible distances that people have traveled. Justice and transformative justice requires accountability um, and that is essential. But if you really want people who have committed violence to understand the harms that they've committed, then you have to help show them empathy and de help them develop their own empathy. If we normalize violence and say, um, you know, what the dehumanization that happens to you is okay, then they don't really understand um, the harms that violence does. Um, the third principle, we really have to acknowledge all victims and work to build communities plagued by violence. And that um, means including lots more perspectives uh, and voice in that work. Uh, community involvement really facilitates both belonging and accountability for both survivors and people who have committed violence. And I believe very strongly that um, the healing that needs to take place in communities, in our in individuals' lives, in our nation, really requires opportunities to make amends. Um, and uh, finally, that systems that cause harm really need to change, particularly systems of racial, gender, and economic oppression have to be dismantled for all of us to experience justice and to break the cycle of violence and incarceration that we're living with now. Some good news, um, prisoners really have a great deal of knowledge and expertise um, for improving prison, their communities, and for reducing crime. And we really need to utilize that knowledge. One of the things we do with the class is come up with reform projects, and we carry these reform projects out to the community, out to the state of Oregon, um, and, and try to bring those voices outside. But we need more of those people released from prison who want to and can contribute meaningful meaningfully to their um, communities. Uh, I, I have found that 
everyone needs a life of meaning and connection. And I have this example and I realize I'm at the 45 minute mark and I do want to tell you quickly about the healing garden. And I won't um, go into too much detail about it, uh, except to say it was, it's really been one of the extraordinary things I feel um, blessed to have been part of since I started this work. Um, the Asian Pacific Family Club had a vision for creating a garden inside OSP, um, one that would um, promote contemplation, meditation, and healing from trauma. Um, they brought me in, really the first meeting with an outside person about this idea, and they had a budget for it of about $100,000. And uh, I thought they were crazy. I didn't think <laughs> that it was ever going to happen. But because I didn't want to say no, I uh, went along with them and they ended up doing this extraordinary thing, uh, applying and getting grants, um, building a community of supporters, um, convincing the administration and getting uh, Hoichi Kurasu to donate the design for the garden and lead the construction of the garden. And it really is, I think, an extraordinary model for criminal justice reform. The garden exists today. I was able to be there at the opening ceremony. Um, it really is an extraordinary place. There's the small door on the left, maybe you can see, and you're supposed to bow your head to go into the garden, which is an act of humility, and then you're open to this incredible world with a koi pond and you can feed the koi fish and there's um, a whole journey you can take. The model I think is to empower people who are incarcerated to have visions for positive change, allow them to partner with community actors that can help bring resources and support. Um, and then you don't even need to use taxpayer dollars um, and really help to you know transform these spaces in my mind this is just a beginning we also know of course that prison education is hugely transformative yes for the prisoners and that's kind of expected but also for my willamette students they will tell you that um, this uh, course is life-changing um, I have never had a class where every single person worked so hard or learned so much. It has certainly changed me. I started with what I would say a strong belief in people, but that um, uh, has just grown and deepened. Um, I've seen what an enormous difference it makes um, when students see the policy impacts when they get proximate to people that are affected by these policies, what a difference that makes. And I have learned the importance of art, um, reflection, poetry. I actually now write poetry, but we end every class with some kind of creative share. Um, and that has, uh, does an extraordinary thing for Kind of connection amongst us as a group and for understanding the fullness of um, who we are. So finally, I'll just let you know, the work continues past the class. I've um, founded the Transformative Justice Initiative at Willamette. I'm still building it. We are still building it. Um, we do have a new website that's uh, in progress that has a number of goals. Um, I really appreciate your listening to me, but um, please do go on the website and contact me if um, you want to learn more about that initiative. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Michaud, for that presentation. Um, we do have uh, a few questions that have already come in. And for other viewers who might wish to also ask questions, um, if you migrate your cursor down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see um, the opportunity for Q&A, and you can click on that and type in your question. Uh, while we're waiting for one or two more questions to come in, um, I wanted to recognize that uh, Senior or Student Scholarship Recognition Day, sorry, is, is happening um, 
also through WooStream on April 22nd. And Professor Michelle, I was wondering if you had any students that you were aware of who were planning to present um, maybe some of their research or some of the, their findings from their work in your course. I, you know, I, I wish I had double checked. I'm pretty sure I have um, one that is looking at um, uh, incarceration and mental health issues, particularly in the state of Arizona, um, and examining the idea of trans institutionalization where uh, people who were pushed out of mental health institutions then end up incarcerated. She has some um, really interesting findings from that work. Uh, Hannah Shotwell. Um, uh, she might be the only one from that class. Usually every year we host a summit in the spring at the end of this class because of COVID-19 things um, are gonna go a little differently. We're gonna have uh, the students create um, uh, videos of their topic ideas and post them on our TJI website. Um, and then, you know, we're still considering whether we can do a kind of, some kind of virtual summit if we could um, connect with the men inside. Right now, unfortunately, we're not able to connect with the students inside um, because of COVID-19. All right, thank you. Uh, the first question that we received is, I know Oregon recently passed legislation to use quotes and quotes, adult in custody and not inmate or prisoner. Can you speak on um, your use of prisoner versus um, another term? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that. And I, um, I generally prefer incarcerated person or person who's incarcerated. It's, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, adult in custody is what uh, Department of Corrections uses, and that is an appropriate term. I find it a little overly sanitizing. Um, uh, adult in custody could mean in custody in a lot of different places. So I, I find it odd to remove the prison from the custody piece of it. And a number of the men that I work with uh, kind of object to that term adult in custody, although they recognize that it is um, a less, much less derogatory term. They prefer that term to inmate. Inmate is considered very derogatory um, and they don't like that term. And they have generally preferred with me uh, using the term prisoner because it's not, it hasn't sanitized the situation. But I, I think the best practice is to say person who's incarcerated or incarcerated person um, because anytime you have a population that um, is subject to a great deal of stigma, the, the kind of new terms that come in um, are end up getting stigma attached to it. And so, you know, it used to be that inmate wasn't considered derogatory. It was a lot better than convict. And then prisoner was considered better than inmate. Um, but I think um, people who are incarcerated is probably the best term. Thank you. Our next question, do you have plans to partner with Willamette University's new Department of Public Health um, to do uh, any work at Oregon State Penitentiary? Well, um, in fact, my prison class counts as part of the public new public health major, and I also teach a public policy class that counts toward the public health major. I have not necessarily focused on public health, but I think the public health angle is a, a really terrific one, not only for thinking about the effects of incarceration, but for thinking about violence and, and treating violence like a public health problem, I think gets us um, to a much um, a better approach than, than how we have generally thought of things. And if you think, look at different paths to prison, 
addiction is a major path to prison. And we could instead think of that as a public health problem. Um, economic deprivation, of course, is, is one of the other big paths, uh, as is, as I suggested, exposure to violence. Um, and if we thought about violence in a much more holistic way, I think we would help to end mass incarceration, but not just end mass incarceration, but help solve the problem of violence in our communities. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, this next question sounds a little complicated, but I think, I think we'll, we'll go for it. Given a limited amount of government dollars that are available for transformative justice, do you think that money should be focused on the community side, such as foster care in poor communities or reforming prison conditions to focus on rehabilitation, or on the reentry end, assuming that um, incarcerated individuals have resources upon release? Yeah, so this is hard. We know that if we um, spend less on incarceration, have fewer people incarcerated, uh, then we get much better bang for our buck on the prevention end. Spending money on children um, makes a ton of sense. But in fact, I first came to my interest in mass incarceration and, and in prison um, because of uh, my work in welfare policy and, uh, you know, looking around and trying to figure out, you know, where are the men, where are poor men and increasingly realizing poor men are in prison. So I absolutely think we need to be doing a better job of creating a real safety net for poor families and um, including healthcare, um, including access to jobs and education and all that. But I just can't give up on um, the people who are currently incarcerated or getting out now. And I don't think we need to necessarily make that trade-off. And that's why I really like the model of the Healing Garden, because it really helped to leverage community funds um, for us, this program. And uh, so we were able it, it, to not take away from public dollars for prevention and still um, make a huge investment in OSP. Now, I think there are more programs like that that communities would be willing to support, um, not just around gardens, but um, education more broadly. And I think we absolutely have to restore um, federal Pell Grant money so that people who are incarcerated can access education um, and get degrees, we know that you greatly reduce recidivism rates for people who are involved in education programs. These programs work um, and the massive federal funding for them was cut in, with the 1993 crime bill and that needs to be restored. It's been restored in pieces um, and Chemeketa does have a grant for it, but we need to restore that fully all across the 50 states and expand it. All right, thank you. This is a quick question. I believe you mentioned a book that Carlos really liked, and that we have a viewer who wanted to, to catch that, that title. Oh, author's last name is Lynn, L-I-N, and um, I'm going to forget the exact title now, but it um, uh, has prison reform in the title. If, if you want to shoot me uh, an email, I can get it for you. It's senior, senior brain, I guess. Um, not remembering. Reform in the making. That's what it is. Reform in the making. And she was very nice. She was nice enough um, when we contacted her. She donated the books for our class. Um, so I really appreciated that. 
It's pretty wonky though. Excellent. I'm glad that you remembered that title. Here's another question. Are there programs for sex offenders? I don't see much rehabilitation for this group of people. Uh, yeah, there are. Um, it is a hard issue. There are sex offenders in my class. Um, uh, there have been, anyway. Um, you know, the sex offense, sex offenders are a very large umbrella. So that includes a lot of different people with, in fact, very different um, needs for programming. Um, they are very ostracized in the prison. So sometimes um, if there's anyone who's known to have a sex offense, um, other people won't join in the class. Um, so, you know, that's one of the divisions that we've had to manage. Um, we don't, there, there, I don't, I've never had anyone who's had, you know, a childhood abuse sex offense in my class. Um, but there was somebody who, um, there is somebody who has worked as a, a pimp. I can't think of what the, the correct, politically correct word for that is, um, which is a sex offense. And, um, you know, he has really undergone, uh, he's one of the people who's undergone a really incredible transformation during the time that I've known him and thinking about uh, the harms that he committed because he came to prison feeling pretty strongly that he had not committed any harms because the women who worked for him did so voluntarily in his mind. So that, that's that been, um, you know, a long ongoing conversation and development. Um, but there, there need to be, you know, more programs certainly for that particular population and their particular needs. And, um, you know, there aren't, there aren't enough. I really appreciate all that OSP does to open up to the community and make programming available, but it's, you know, it's still not adequate. And there are lots of prisons who just don't have that at all. All right. Thank you. Um, is your course unique um, in this, in the, in its approach to, to, have students come into the prison and learn alongside incarcerated folks. Um, it's not this, unique. Yeah. Are there it, other colleges and universities that, that do this? So it's not unique. Um, in fact, there are a couple of other classes that come into OSP too. Um, there are classes across the country that are doing this. Um, and there are particular programs like um, Inside Out, College Inside Out that foster these kinds of programs. Um, mine perhaps is a little different in that it is, um, it is a, you know, it's a 300 level class. It's quite intensive. The men in prison tell me it's harder than those other classes. Um, they, but they kind of have made that into a point of pride. Um, and the other thing that they told me when I started this class, when they asked me to do the class, was they didn't want to just focus on the problems. They wanted to be part of the solution, and they really wanted us to work on investigating and trying to propose reforms. And the reforms that they've come up with over the years, some are very um, you know, ambitious about reforming Measure 11, um, some are, are, are smaller scale. Um, they're really all over the board, but um, we're trying to design a way that these proposals are not merely academic. Not only do we do the summit, um, but we, where we invite lawmakers, Oregon lawmakers to come, advocates, community members, people from DOC, anybody who's interested. And sometimes, you know, those ideas, maybe not the exact ideas we came up with, but they start conversations, they make connections. Um, and the part of the idea of um, founding TJI is that we take 
a couple of these ideas that come out of the summit every year and try to continue them on and, and build them and work on them. So we currently are working on three actual ideas that came out of last year's summit. Um, one is trying to get the last mile to Oregon, which is a um, organization that provides coding and IT technology training to prisoners. So they um, give the kind of training that produce um, higher paying jobs. Um, we've been in conversations with them and been trying to figure out perhaps a fundraising plan, a strategy plan for that. Um, and then there's a group of incarcerated men who worked on the reentry plan from last year, and they've been expanding and developing the plans for that. And so we're trying to support that initiative that's going on inside with the basic idea that we shouldn't be focusing on reentry just in the last six months of incarceration or six weeks of incarceration, whatever it is. We should be thinking about reentry as soon as someone is willing or as soon as they get to prison. And that's going to involve dealing with um, their trauma and um, figuring out um, the patterns that led to addiction or to violence and to breaking those patterns. It's going to involve, you know, creating um, a credit history. I mean, for some of these young men, you know, uh, they come into prison at a very young age. They've never had a job on the outside, a paid um, um, employment on the outside, and there's so much they need to understand about adulting. Only now when they get out of prison, they're going to be in their 30s or 40s or even 50s. So um, the men inside have a lot of great ideas that wouldn't cost a lot of money if they can use community partners to provide these services and create this programming. Um, and so that's the other thing that we're trying to work on. And then there's a final component of a um, peace and justice studies um, program that would be both at Willamette and at OSP and could result in perhaps a certification or some kind of certificate with real like mediation training. So a lot of the men inside do regular um, nonviolent mediation, conflict resolution work, but they don't have the formal training. And so when they get out, they it's hard to necessarily prove that to someone. So to have a program where they could get um, certification is one of our goals. So yeah, there, we have a lot. We have a lot going on, and a lot that uh, we hope to do and build and grow. So in that way, I think the class is a little different because it doesn't die. The class never dies. It just continues on. Yes, excellent. And I think that's a high characteristic of Willamette, right? The turning of knowledge into action, and and then taking. Um, those insights forward to make change in the world. So that's fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all the questions. There are many more questions that have poured in, but I think we, we could end on a positive note with this question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you tell a positive story about Anton at the end. Oh, um, Arnaldo, this, yeah, this, sorry. This, oh, yeah, this, so this viewer still hopes that you will, and I think that'd be a, a nice way to, to finish up tonight. Arnaldo is on the right. And um, as I said, he spent 19 years in prison and had been, you know, gang involved. And he was one of my facilitators for the class. And I was talking with him before uh, he got out. Was he nervous? No, he wasn't nervous. Um, but I was worried for him. And I've been able to keep in touch with Arnaldo because he comes back and talks to my classes. Um, I'm not allowed to have a personal relationship with him, but for educational reasons, we still connect. And I can say now, almost three years later, he has a, he's married. He has a um, son who's uh, almost two, um, who's the most adorable little boy that he is working for Latino um, uh, network. He is the youth empowerment and violence prevention 
coordinator. He's so he's doing the very work he said he wanted to do um, when he got out. And um, he and his family just recently bought a house. He just talked to my class on Monday night and he was Zooming from um, his, the new house that they just bought. And it's just a wonderful success story. And I also will tell you that he said he spent the first 10 years in prison still being engaged in violence. Um, and the so the transformation was not fast, but I, I hardly know anyone who's more um, thoughtful um, uh, about uh, the, the journey that he's been on and uh, really uh, in his desire to give back and build his community. It's just, it's a wonderful story. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And thanks very much, Melissa, for this excellent humanizing and thought-provoking presentation this evening. I hope your work causes many of us to stop and reflect on our current prison system and consider ways to strive for positive change. So thanks so much for, for being with us this evening. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, thanks for joining us. We hope that you will stay tuned to WooStream as we'll be adding new content weekly. Please share your feedback with us and suggestions for additional content to alumni at willamette.edu.